so I can see this group of young ladies here. Otherwise, they'll be making faces at me while I'm preaching, and it's not right. So, I'm kidding. They're, they're always very good up here. I appreciate that. All right, we're going to be First Peter chapter three. Uh, I'm excited about tonight. This is a um, a complicated passage of scripture. I think uh, if it's, it's fair. I guess I don't know. Um, I don't think it's incredibly complicated. But the reason I say complicated is because there's a lot of doctrines that um, that don't fit in with uh, what we would teach that come out of this. Now, it doesn't mean that this doesn't agree with what we teach. The Bible's consistent. But, um, but there's a lot, I'll say it this way, there's a lot of verses in this passage of Scripture that you can grab one verse and take it to mean pretty much whatever you want. And so unless you read it in context, you miss a lot. So 1 Peter chapter 3, let's start it with one verse and see if we can take it out of context. I'm kidding. No, we're just going to look at it. And so um, just want you to think about it. And, and uh, maybe it's a context that will help correct in your life. Um, the title of the message tonight is Real Apologetics. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the word apologetics? Apologetics. Anybody, anybody have, excuse me, anybody have a, a thought? What, what does apologetics mean? What's a description, a definition of apologetics? I won't bash you or anything like that. So, a- anybody? Daryl? Oh, uh, John? Defense of, the faith. Defense of the faith. Okay, and in a broad way, that, that's good. All right, would you agree with that would be a statement, or maybe you have a different way of defining it? Defense yeah. of the faith? Okay, okay, all right. Uh, anybody else have some, some uh, the response on that one? Uh, the, the, the term apologetics really has more so the idea of a, uh, a reasoned answer, a reasoned answer. So in the, the simplicity of a defense of the faith is the application of it, no doubt, um, but, but it's a reasoned answer. In other words, <laughs> there's a reason for why we do things, and there's an answer that is reason. Now, here's, here's what's going to happen is that um, this becomes – a passage. Of scripture. In fact, we didn't read the passage. Let's go ahead and read the passage. I'll give you some thoughts. We'll pray, and then we'll go go through the the, the whole section we're going to be going through. Verse number. And by the way, we are going to go through the end of the chapter today. So just keep that in mind. Verse number fifteen. <clears throat> but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. The passage of scripture here is oftentimes used as a reason for why we should have ministries that are dedicated specifically and only to, to formulating good answers to common questions about Christianity. Uh, to be honest with you, <coughs> that has nothing to do with the passage. And so the, uh, we're going to look at that bro- in a broader sense, um, what he's talking about. Should we have good answers for, for what we believe? Absolutely. In fact, I believe one of the reasons why we have so many people def- departing from the faith is they don't know why. There's a challenge that comes up, and somebody asks the question, a, a reason for the hope that's within them, and it's kind of like, I don't know, so how about we just do something else? And there's a million different things that would be against you in regards to doctrines and teachings that, that you believe that, that you could come up with good, reasoned responses, and, and we would go to something else. I remember there's a young man, uh, thankfully he got saved after this, but uh, we had been praying for this guy to get saved for about five years. And uh, we'd been praying, we'd fasted over him, took him to evangelistic meetings, uh, hoping that he would get saved. And um, anyways, one day he was telling me about how he can't sleep and um, that he just, what, what can I do? I can't sleep and just struggling with stuff. And I said, it's because you're going to hell and, uh, and you're, you're lost. You're not, you're not going to have peace and you're trying to get peace. And uh, he says, you know what, I really felt, and we had just come out of a message, and uh, he said, you know, I felt like I should have gotten saved, but I'm just not ready for it yet. And so he didn't, so he didn't want to get saved that night. And, and anyways, uh, a few weeks later, he asked me a question. He said, how could I be happy, but don't give me a God response? Don't give me a God way of being happy. Like, how could I be happy without, like, the Bible? And I'm like, you, you, you came to the wrong guy. I don't, I don't, have, I don't, I don't know another answer. And so, um, so anyways, going through that, and we were talking about Proverbs, and I was pointing out, because like, I'd been teaching through Proverbs at the time, and he said if, um, if, I go, if I follow the things in Proverbs that I don't believe in God or I don't believe in salvation, then can I be happy? No, it's impossible. It's impossible because it has to do with God himself. And so we're going to look at this, this point here, and the point that I want to make here is when it comes to Christ, when it comes to Christianity, when it comes to what we believe, 
the point of it is not necessarily just to have a good answer because we can come up with stuff. Sometimes we take verses like this one, and that means we're going to try to make it in such a way that it's as palatable as possible to the rest of the world. And we can make it in such a way that it's going to be received well. Where they're, oh, you know, this guy's actually a nice guy. He's not some jerk independent Baptist. You know, he's, he's just a really nice guy. And, um, and so he just and it, it's very thorough and thoughtful as far as why. But the point is that the reasoning behind it is not, has nothing to do at all with um, just some kind of philosophical reason for why we believe what we believe. To start off with, I want to mention something very, very plainly just at the get-go. Our belief in Christ is a faith position. We, we, what we believe about Christ and the Christian life is faith. And what I mean by that is, yes, there are rational elements to it, and, and there's a tremendous amount of rationality. And not only that, there's, there's reason involved in how these things work and facts and things of that nature. We can go with history, but it's derived by faith. Uh, when you think about the Word of God, when we have faith in the Word of God, do, are there historical arguments that can point to being the Word of God? Sure. To its preservation historically, yeah, the, the study side of it. But it's not that complicated. We literally just have faith in what God says, and that's the, that's the starting point. And, and unfortunately, what we do in Christianity is we try to build up this rational reason, and that's why we have faith. But it's backwards. We have faith. Hence, we can learn a lot about the rationality. Just to give an example, if you get saved, the moment you got saved, how much soteriology did you understand? How many of you don't even know what soteriology means? Uh, yeah, so, so the point is that the doctrine of salvation, you may not have understood the whole ramification of it, but you understood something. You trust Jesus, he'll save you. That's as much soteriology as you need. That's how much doctrine of salvation that you need. When you trust in Christ and the finished work on the cross, his resurrection, you trust in him, you're saved. And so my point on this, it, is, it comes from the standpoint of faith. Same thing with evolution and creation. I've been going through a lot, just studying on that and just trying to figure out a, a plan. I've, I've been reading a lot. I've been watching videos on it. And, and most fights that I see about it, people still try to attack evolution by a philosophical way. And they try to defend Christ, uh, creation on a philosophical level and abandon the fact that it is faith. And so we try to support creation based on the same way evolution is supported, we're, we're fighting a losing battle. We're fighting a completely losing battle because it is a faith. It, it, it's a completely different way of thinking. And so true apologetics have to be found in the, in the right way. And so uh, this also means that we don't have to set up ways in which that we're going to defend it. Because uh, the concept would be that we just have this big battle against us, and we, now we just have to find everywhere that's going to fight us, and, and um, that we can go and look for a fight. And this is not what the passage is saying. So we're going to look at this more in context and just show, um, give a reasoned response to what this is saying here in this chapter. All right, so let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll get right into this. If you would pray as well that I'd have clarity in what I'm preaching. Um, I don't have a, like a... Roman numeral one, two, three, A, B, C, you know, lowercase I type thing. I, it's, it's, it's literally just going to go verse by verse, and I don't have a, a set outline for it. And I just, I, as I was studying, I'm thinking that's just probably the best thing we can do is go verse by verse and explain it that way. So let's pray. God, I thank you for this passage. Help us, Lord, as we study. My, my desire is not just that I would be accurate, uh, but truly that it would be compelling to, to exhort us into righteousness, to live godly, to sanctify you in our hearts, that we would live godly in you, that we would go through anything that you would have us go through for your glory and your honor. So we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so where we left off is uh, primarily uh, in verse number 10. We talked about if any man will love his life for, uh, for, the, um, for he that will love life. And, and so the concept having to do with the family, the family unit. But now the, the point on that, though, is that um, the family unit is in reference to the greater context of suffering. Now, First Peter, he is addressing the Christian who is suffering or in, impending suffering, you're going through suffering, or you've been through suffering, the point on that is that there is a difficulty in the Christian life that is unique, all right? So it's not just that you're going to get saved and everything is just going to be wonderful and happy. Now, that's one of the blessings, by the way, about church, isn't it? Because you go to a place where you don't get persecution for being a Christian, or at least you shouldn't. It's a sad thing to me when, when Christians would go, and I've not seen this here, praise the Lord, but where, where Christians will tell people, oh, you're too zealous, or you're too, you love Jesus too much, and how about we just calm down a little bit? Thankfully, we don't have that kind of environment here, but that's not an uncommon environment in churches. And, and, and so church ought to be a place that fosters that. In essence, this is a slice of heaven. 
Now, not exactly what heaven's going to be like, but literally the experience that we are, we are one with the Father, united in Christ in this location as we would be for eternity. We get to experience a little bit of that every time we go to church because it's different from what we get outside of that. And what he's addressing in this chapter 3 is that that also applies to the home. He's saying you, you stick to it. Ladies, you stick to it in regards to what your role as a wife is and as a servant of God in spite of difficulty. Husbands, you lead in such a way that it's, a, it's in, in um, what, he, what he tells the, the, um, the husbands, uh, dwell according to knowledge, giving honor. In other words, what you're doing, you keep at it, you adjust it according to the knowledge and, 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 uh, of your wife and giving honor to your wife, but the point is that you're, you keep at it. Wives submit, but you keep at it. In, um, in the previous chapter, in chapter number two, it speaks about this, these same things that um, with the example of Jesus Christ, who on his own body bare our sins, went through the great difficulty of those things, and yet he stayed humble. Yet in all of those things, he, he didn't revile. He, he acted differently than a lot of the world would in spite of all the things that were going on against him. And so anyways, in those things, he's talking about the, the, the testimony of standing up for Christ and doing what's right and, and, and being a consistent witness of who we are in spite of persecution, in spite of difficulty, in spite of suffering. All right, so the word I want you to remember for tonight is suffering because this is really going to unlock the rest of the chapter number three. The rest of chapter three is not random. Let me give you some of the, the points on there um, that you'll just a couple highlights from the rest of the chapter. Um, it started off with wives submitting to their husbands, husbands um, dwelling with his wife, their wives according to knowledge and honor. Um, then uh, the way we ought to live with each other in verse number 8, 9, and 10, talking about the way we speak and the way we interact with each other. Uh, but then he also talks about making sure you're not doing wrong. Don't do wrong. Um, verse number 15 is a verse we just read on apologetics. Verse number uh, 18 and 19 is going to speak of Christ, the suffering he went through, as well as verse 19, which throws a lot of, a lot of people for a loop, uh, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. And so that gets lifted to be this completely other subject matter uh, a lot of times in the way that we use it. Uh, but then we talk about verse number 20, talking about the ones in Noah's age um, and that only eight were saved. Verse 21 is a really, really big one. Um, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. And so there's just a lot in this passage of Scripture, super controversial. Um, but what happens is all of these passages and all these texts become like all these very different messages. It's one message, and it's all about suffering as far as a Christian goes or, and, and continuing to do what's right. The first song we sang tonight, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. That was intentional because that's literally what he's talking about, standing up for Jesus. And so verse 15 is actually a, a big part of that because he gives the answer for how this is going to be done. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. In other words, no matter what, your heart is God's. And you make the purpose about your life God, and that's how you're going to suffer. And then he's going to give all the rest of that as far as example, what we're doing, why we should continue doing it. All right? So going on into this, the verse-by-verse -verse message for this evening, I want you to notice in verse number uh, 11, uh, it is a continuation of what we're not supposed to say. But, um, but it's not just what we say, but then also our actions, not that they should be peaceful sayings. So, in other words, don't be contentious in the words that we say. Verse number 11, talks. verse number 10 is talking about that, all these contentious things that we do. So you've got to be careful with that kind of thing. Uh, hit me right between the eyes when I went through that. But in verse number 11, he's going to say in a broader way that there ought to be a mentality that's different. He says, verse 11, let him eschew or to shun or abstain from what? From evil. Let him eschew evil. And do good, let him seek peace and ensue it. In other words, he's saying that there is a life that ought to be lived. It's not just things that you don't do, but instead there are things that you are doing. You're pursuing peace and good. These are the things you're supposed to be doing. And by the way, you're doing though so in a, con in a context or in a society that may not be for it. There are times where, where society accepts those good things, but there are times that they don't. Uh, I don't know about you, I, I went to a college uh, where... The men, a lot of times, acted like men. And, and uh, Brett, Aaron, you've probably seen this where uh, maybe you've been there where you get stuck holding the door. And so we'd have a tiny little campus. We're 150-some acres. And um, we have 
thousands of people in this tiny campus is built up. And so, and, and there's occasions like chapel where all those people are in one building. They all have to leave this one building. And so being the kind gentleman that we are, we open the door, and then suddenly 300 women are going to come through <laughs> that door. So you just stand there. Girl, facial hair, you get written up for having too much facial by the end of it just because it's like how long you've been standing there. And so it, anyways, that, that, that time period where you're doing this thing. But you know what? I've, I've held the door for people that are offended that I held the door for them. Not, not in school, but like, like in the store. It's like, I can do this. Like, I know you can do this. That's not the point. I don't do things for you just because you can't do it. The, 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 and, and I hold it for guys. It's not like, oh, well, I, you're a female, so I didn't pu- think you could possibly put the 10 pounds of pressure into opening this door. The, the idea here is it's a kindness that's done, and people would be offended by that kind of thing. And you know the reality, though, of serving females as far as men opening doors? That's a, that's a chivalrous, nice man thing to do. But it's sourced in Christianity as far as why we have that kind of mentality of, of us um, of protecting women and things of that nature. And so, so with that, a lot of the world is against it because how dare we belittle women to open a door for them? The reality is any of you men are coming through, we open the door. In fact, we have men that open the doors here for everybody. It's very rare I open the doors on a Sunday because somebody will open the door for me. I don't think, oh, I can't believe Jack over there diminishes my my importance by thinking I can't open a door. No, of course not. It's just a respect that's going to be shown. And so the, the point is that that we are living in a culture that's not necessarily for all our Christian principles and is increasingly becoming, even in the minutia, the, the tiniest little things that, that we do are being criticized if there's any sort of good in them. And so anyways, but he's saying you do it and you do it no matter what. It's the same context that he's been talking about from chapter number two. And uh, notice, here's why. And this is very important because verse 11 and 12, do what's right, do what's good. And here's why. Verse number 12, for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. He's saying, don't be against God because if you do evil like the rest of society, God sees that. But if you do righteously, God is seeing the righteous and he sees what you do. So he's do it. And so the concept would be there that you need to have, and this is the word you'll see later, a good conscience toward God in the way we're doing things. And so this is what he's establishing here is this principle. And so go down, uh, verse number 13. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? And so who's going to be against you? Now, if you do good things, who will be against you? Now, the idea is not like, well, everybody's going to love you if you do good things. But the idea here is that only bad people would be against you for doing good things. Righteous people, godly people. And by the way, I'm calling Christians righteous people. Okay, this is the expectation. So as far as this goes, righteous people, Christians will be for you. And you know who else is for you? More importantly, according to this, God is for you in doing this. So in other words, in verse number 13, he's saying your attention ought to be about God. You're doing this so God sees it, not so everybody in the neighborhood can see what a nice guy you are. Uh, and it's those times where we're going to have a press conference to talk about the donation that we made just out of our benevolence. I've decided to give people this. If you were truly benevolent, you would just give it, and you don't have to announce it to anybody. And so in this, he's saying it's for God's audience. In verse number 14, but, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, what he's saying is that when we have these types of opportunities to serve God, do it. But he says so in light of the terror people can put you through. Because in verse number 14, he talks about being not afraid of their terror. This is the things that people would put you through. There are times as Christians we don't want to do what's right because of what other people think or what other people might do. And he's saying don't be afraid of it. What if it costs you, though? What if it costs your job to stand up for Christ? What if it costs you your neighborhood? You're no longer welcome in there. What if it costs you a family function? What if it costs you a certain family meal? Whatever it may be, there are things that we would say, I'm going to obey God rather than man, and regardless of the terror that they would try to put Christians through. And so he's saying don't do that because, and notice according to verse 14, you're happy if you suffer for righteousness sake. Now, the concept of that is not like through the immediate suffering, I'm just so glad that I'm getting beat right now. That's not the idea, but he's saying you have an eternal perspective on this, that your eternal perspective is such that you are happy in the reward God gives. And so we have a bigger reward than what's here on this earth. People live for this world. The world's mindset, the world's thinking is all about this world. He's saying you're thinking about things eternally. Verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Isn't it interesting the word but there is mentioned? 
and we forget why. And we're like, all right, now be apologists. Well, well, remember, the word but there is because he's saying those people that would be afraid of their terror, instead you, but sanctify the Lord God in your heart. So while you, you, what you're saying is, I want you to make sure you suffer for righteousness sake. Go ahead and do it. If it's hard, do it. Don't be afraid of their terror, but what he's saying, sanctify the Lord God in your heart. So he's given you what your heart ought to be. Your heart ought to be that God then is what your soul purpose is about. The idea of sanctified, literally set apart. God is the sole purpose and direction and goal of your heart. We strive, we press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's what he's telling us here. And that's the whole idea of sanctify the Lord God in your heart. In other words, you have a singular purpose, and that's why you are going through what you're going through, in spite of difficulties. We stay constant. We see this in our families, husbands and wives, even that may have that difficulty at the beginning of the chapter. We might see this with employers. We might see this in politics or society in general, chapter number two. Uh, but the point is we take on the example of Jesus, and we still keep going because God is our sole purpose. He is the one that, we're sanct that has been sanctified, set aside for. This is the only thing. And literally, the idea would be that the preeminence of Jesus Christ is all that we're living for. And so when you would suffer, and you would suffer because Christ is your only purpose for living, be ready, al be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So what's he talking about in the verse? He's literally telling you when you would suffer for Jesus, in your suffering, then be ready to answer. It's, it's, it's a slight difference the way we take it. We're like, okay, we're going to take to the world this answer. That's not what he's saying. When you go through things, your testimony should be that you have a reasoned response in this answer that you would have for why you're going through it. Why are you willing to give up certain things? Why are you willing to give up certain music and certain dress styles and certain, certain speech, uh, speech and things that you would say and, and certain locations that you would no longer go to? Why is it that you're willing to do that? Why is it that you're willing to abandon certain forms of entertainment and leisure? Why would you do that? Well, it's because when you're questioned about that, you can make it because it's all about Jesus. The whole goal is about Christ. And what he's saying, you need to have an answer for why it's about Christ. This is literally saying, I'm pointing to my testimony. This is what Jesus did for me, and this is why I'm willing to do it for Jesus. He's talking about being crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He's saying, this is what my life is about. This is the reason response. You'll notice in that it doesn't have a lot of science. I don't have a lot of science in this one. Okay, well, wait a second. Um, the reason why I'm willing to suffer is because the molecular structure of which makes up my body equals itself to about $6 in chemical, or, uh, chemicals and minerals. And because of that, I realize my, worth is, my life is not worth much, hence Christ is worth more. It's not that complicated. Jesus saved me, and that's why I'm willing to suffer for Jesus. That's the whole point of the passage. And so the reason, in verse number 15... Listen, I'm, be wise about the way you're answering. I understand creation. Understand those things. This is just not the verse for that. And when, when it comes to that, he's talking about the reason for your relationship with God and why you're committed to him. That's what he's talking about. Now, he tells you about how you answer, by the way. The end of the verse, um, the, asking you a reason of the hope that is in you. By the way, that hope. Why do you have the joyful expectation? Imagine, imagine the joyful expectation of people that are being literally bound to a stake and wood set around them in, in flames, and yet they would still sing glories to God. Uh, one, one of the martyrs that went on before has literally talked about him being burnt up like a grain so he could be turned into a holy loaf for God. It's a weird statement, but the point is, like, this is all I am. This is all I am. I'm glad to do this for, for Jesus. I, I have the response this is all about Christ. Uh, some that would, would talk about the, the, the pains of this world being just for a moment, literally in the joy of, of, of dying for Jesus. I mean, just suffering. But the point is that he does this, he says, with meekness and fear. Verse 15 is often used to have this type of, like, academic excellence above the world. And we talk about the, the stupidity of, of the world's philosophers and how dumb they are. And yet he says that in the verse that we've taken out of context to have why we should have the superiority of people, we forgot why, how he said to do it, meekness and in fear. Literally that you are lower, you place yourself lower. 
those, those people that don't understand the things you understand about your relationship with Christ, he said you have to have a meekness toward them. A meekness toward them. This is not a weakness. This is not that you can't. You understand something they don't. That's a good thing, but that doesn't make you superior. And so he tells you then to have a meekness and fear. So a meekness then would be your relationship to them. The fear, what is he talking about? Didn't he just tell you don't be afraid of their terror? We're talking about, once again, back all the way to what he told us about in verse number, um, verse number 12, for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. Uh, verse number 13, um, and who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? So against, against, again about Christ, about God and his judgment. The point is that it, our, our fear before God a genuine, uh, not just a reverence, but literally a fear that we are more concerned about doing what God wants. And once again, a clear conscience before God. I, I, I'd rather do what God wants me to do. I, I could easily give in. I could easily say the same things. I could easily laugh at the same jokes in the break room. I could do the same things. Or I could do something that God is pleased with because he sees it. And now this is important because we'll say this and we're like, okay, now I'm superior with meekness and in fear. Meekness and fear. Verse number 16, having a good conscience, there it is, having a good conscience. That's what he's been talking about this whole time, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ, literally your behavior, your manner of life, that they would be ashamed for falsely accusing you. The shame won't come immediately, but the point is that you will stay above board, you will stay consistent. So it's not a matter of you taking a stand one time, but that you consistently walk with God even in a public setting. And so, um, so anyways, they're, they're going to speak evil of you. It's going to happen. What, what's he telling you about? It's interesting. You're going to find that uh, Christianity is not always going to be the most popular thing. We've, we've had time periods in history where Christianity was more popular. It's true. But the reality is generally amongst all the times of history, Christianity has never been the most popular thing. Uh, in fact, even in Christian cultures, uh, those that would try to take a stand for Christ would still be ridiculed oftentimes by Christians. Um, in, in this, it's, it's explaining to them where um, they will speak evil of you, literally things that would destroy your testimony, things about you. The point is let God do that battle. You stand up for Christ doing what you're supposed to. Eventually, they'll be ashamed of that. You just stay consistent. Verse 17, for it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Don't suffer because you decided to be dumb. All right, I'm sure there's other words. Actually, the way he said it is better than what I said. Verse number 17, but don't. For evil doing, if you're going to suffer for doing wrong, evil doing, things that would damage your own testimony, there's no, there's no point in that suffering. Why? You're going to have suffering without it, so why, why, why add more? Um, so verse number 18, and by the way, verse 17 points to the, the chastisement of God on his children for, for acting wrong. So now you have chastisement from God, plus when you're trying to walk with God, then you have the, 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 the difficulty and the terror of the people as well. So verse number 18, he's going to give the example. This is an example of why, okay? Verse number 18, 19, and 20 all come together. The example, first off, is going to be of Christ, same thing as we saw back in chapter number 2 when it talks about his suffering and how he was reviled and reviled not. So anyways, in this, um, verse number 18, it says, For Christ also hath once suffered. You see that key there again. Notice it says, Once also hath once suffered. What's, what's he saying? Like your suffering, Christ also suffered is the idea. And so once again, that's how we know it's talking about suffering. Uh, hath once suffered for sins. Now, wait a second. He suffered for sin. Did Christ ever commit a sin? No. So Christ suffered for other people's sins. So he's talking about your Christian life. It should be like that, where the suffering that you go through is because other sinful people are doing sinful things that cause your suffering. Christ suffered for sins. But then notice what he says, the just for the unjust. So literally the, the idea here is that Christ did suffer because of their sin, but he also suffered for their sin. And because of their sin, for their sin, that he might bring us to God. In other words, it resulted in something wonderful. By, then standing, by him doing what was right, standing up for what God had sent him to do, he suffered the just Christ for the unjust, the world. For what? According to this, that he might bring us to God. Being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. And so he gives us the whole context here. Yes, they are able to beat him. And here's what he's pointing out. He suffered, and he did something. He brought us to God, and it resulted in him dying. And that doesn't sound very encouraging, does it? But here's what he casts to us here, is that the most that they could do is kill his flesh, but quickened in the Spirit, his resurrection. 
this is what he did. This is what he he died. They gave him everything. They could kill the body is what the Bible would describe. But quickened the spirit, made alive. He, he was resurrected. And so in this, we understand made alive in this, by the spirit. This is what Jesus Christ did. And it did something wonderful by him suffering and doing still what he's supposed to. Yes, it results in him dying, but resurrected. A good result. Verse number uh, 19. By the way, notice the punctuation at the end of verse number 18. This is important because verse number 18 is not a standalone verse. The sentence continues in verse number 19, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Now, in this passage of Scripture, in verse number 19, he's saying, by which? By what? By his death, by suffering and his resurrection. So it's not just his resurrection, but his, his, res, his suffering and resurrection. He suffered, that's the point of verse number 18, and resurrected, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Notice that's also not the full sentence. It continues on to the next verse as well. This is the verse that gets thrown a tremendous amount um, around. It has to do with everything. <laughs> and so uh, if you were to open up 10 different commentaries, you're going to find 10 different things of what this can mean. Um, so I'm going to give you the answer, possible answers, maybe a couple things. You might disagree with me on a few of them. And so um, anyways, on this one, he's going to tell us a couple things. First off, I want you to understand that when it comes to uh, what we're looking for, um, in verse number 19, we understand the context of by which having to do with his suffering, the, the death, the, the resurrection. So that's the which. Also, he went. And so went where? And preached unto the spirits in prison. And so where did he go? What did he preach? Some people are like, oh, well, this is the message he preached. Um, unto the spirits. What are the spirits? Are they people? Are they people on this earth? Are they people in hell? Are they people in, in, in many other places, in paradise, in Abraham's bosom, in heaven? I mean, there's, the list goes on and on. Um, the, or is it angels? Is it, I mean, are they, are they fallen angels? I mean, this is literally the list. It just kind of keeps going as far as who, who the spirits are. Then it says in prison. And so prison, what's the prison here? Well, uh, let's start off with a couple of things. One, uh, you'll notice that the punctuation ends... Um, does not end with a period in verse number 19 because he's going to explain in the next verse the time frame, which sometime were disobedience when once the long suffering of God waited in when? The days of Noah. Okay, so verse number 20 is not a random other reference. He's talking about uh, something that's going to explain verse number 19. And so understanding this, this is not saying, because uh, a lot of times this will be, okay, well, this is where, where um, Jesus went into the spirits in prison during the time where he died, suffered, and was killed in the flesh and before he was quickened. The problem with that, um, when verse number 19 goes into that comma, but was quickened, like right there, and that's describing his three days of death, uh, there's a lot of doctrine that, for one thing, grammatically is not supported by this passage. The other thing is um, people take that way too far with things that are not there. Uh, one of the doctrines that also that's taught is also from the Mormons that would say that that's when Christ left, you know, his body and went to. Anybody know where he went to? Of all places? Uh, to America. <laughs> he came to America. Uh, America's not hell. All right. So the, the, the point is he came to America, right? And so when he witnessed to, like, the Indians and stuff like that. So there's all sorts of different ideas of, of where, where Jesus went from that. Here's the problem is that when it comes to this, he explains a little bit um, better in regards to these things. Now, notice what he's going to tell us here. Um, in this, he talks about that he preached unto the Spirit. The word preach literally is the word proclaim. So something is proclaimed. Uh, the thoughts on this one is, is, is varied. One, well, let me so, explain one thing first. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 5. Um, you're welcome to look there or write it down. Maybe just look at it on your own time. I'll read it. It says, Thus saith God, the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it and spirit to them that walk therein, I, verse number six, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people for a light of the Gentiles. Notice what the next verse, verse seven says, Isaiah 42, seven, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. So. If he's explaining this, verse number seven, prisoners from prison, 
He has just explained what that prison was. The ones that are in darkness, the ones that are without a covenant, the ones that have no breath on them. Literally, these are people that are dead. Not literally physically dead, but they're dead in Christ. They are not saved people. Isaiah 61 explains it well as well. Very, very well. Uh, verse 1, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Now, this is the same text that Jesus would read um, when he goes to, to the synagogue. This is the Spirit of the Lord the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings of unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. What's he telling them here? Those people that are currently in bondage. That's what he's describing it. You'll see this over and over again in regards to captivity and into prison. He's describing those people that are bound and don't have that life. This is not, some people literally suggest that Jesus went to hell and he preached to people again about the possibility of being spared. And so like there's another salvation that's offered at that point. It's an odd, odd teaching. Um, the consistent teaching in regards to the prison and the captivity is specifically that when Christ came, those that were in prison, those were in ca captivity, those that were blind, those that could not see, those that, um, that needed salvation, they needed breath, they needed life to be made alive, that he did that. And so in Isaiah 61, as he would describe in Luke, is the same thing, that he did that, that day it was fulfilled. Jesus Christ came to do that. And so it's not something that would be fulfilled one day when Jesus died only, but like by Christ himself, he is doing that by arriving, and then of course fulfilled through his death and resurrection. And so this is something he's providing. Now, a, a few other possibilities on that, um, but I'm willing to listen to ideas later, not at this moment, because we have a few more verses to go. Now, uh, continuing on, notice the, the prison he's addressing here. In verse number 20, which sometime, now the word sometime literally just means at a point in past history. We would say a long time ago, uh, which sometime a while back they... Um, they were formerly, were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. So what's he saying? The people in prison were people that were disobedient. They were disobedient. And so this description of these people, according to verse number 20, are the ones that were disobedient to what? To what were they disobedient? Um, in the waited in the days of Noah. So God, long suffering, waited the days of Noah. It takes Noah 120, 100. 120 years to build that ark. That's a long time that God didn't wipe them out. And so what did God do? God's saying he waited that 120 years during that time of that where he didn't wipe them out. So in other words, they were doomed. They were in prison. They were going to die. He was long suffering in that while the ark was, was a preparing. Um, I feel like the G might, might be a transcribal area. It's supposed to be a preparing because if that's how in the south, and so they went up preparing or whatever. And so anyway, so he's preparing, okay? Um, so they, they were, while well, he was, in other words, he's building the ark, wherein few, that is eight souls, were saved by water. And so what is he telling them there? For 120 years, God was long-suffering. Those people that were doomed to hell, those people that were captives, those people that were in prison, he continued and continued in his long-suffering nature to give mercy to them for them to repent. Hey, what, what do you have to do? You have to believe what Noah's telling you. Now, for them specifically, the idea of salvation wasn't necessarily just like as far as a, eternal salvation. It's literally get on the boat. Judgment's coming, right? That's, that's what's going to happen. But then judgment came, and it, it, uh, the Bible says that the, they were saved by water. So eight people were saved by water, which is an unusual way of saying it, isn't it? Because the, the water saved them? Well, they, they, were, they were fine before that. <laughs> you know, the, the eight people were... We're, we're living in sunlight, and, and with they've got, you know, at least a few days before, there's at least, like, animals everywhere, and that's kind of cool. They have a whole petting zoo there, and, and so they, have, they get in the ark, and then when they get in the ark, the waters come down, the floods come up, the, the whole world is covered in water, covering the mountains, and um, the ark saved them, but so did the water. You see, water is going to talk about this um, very important thing. Boy, it's, it's went later than I thought it would. All right, so when it comes to the water... He's addressing the fact that this is that judgment that came. What he's relating is the water would then be a relation to the suffering that would come, that Christ went through. In other words, they went through this. The rejection that people had, they received judgment from that. 
And because the judgment was given, they were spared, the eight people that accepted the truth, were spared from all the wickedness and all the ungodliness that was in the world. The world was wiped out of all that wickedness and sin and, and rejection by that judgment. Uh, this would be similar to what Jesus says in Luke chapter 12, verse 49. I am come to send fire on the earth, and what will I if it be already kindled? But I have a baptism to be baptized with. Now, what's he saying? Jesus says, I, still, I have a baptism to be baptized with. Does that mean that he has to be put underwater, baptized even now, my, my Savior in the name of the... You know, that, that, that wouldn't make sense. But he's already been baptized. Having been baptized, he's saying there's another baptism I have to go through. This is the baptism of judgment. And so, and he says, and how am I straightened? In other words, how restrained to do this till it be accomplished. This is what I have to do. And so in this, when he's talking about this passage of Scripture, he's addressing that this, this judgment that's there is also going to provide a good thing, which is salvation for the eight that are in there. He further explains, you have, you have Christ and that he suffered to the cross, death and resurrection. You have Noah who suffered in that time. People rejected it, but as long as they accepted it, eight souls were saved So, so by, by the water. And then verse 21 is going to mention baptism. Now, the word baptism, of course, is important. Uh, the word saved, by the way, just to let you know, the word saved doesn't always mean soteriological salvation. It's a good, good expensive word. Um, saving grace as far as from heaven, from hell to heaven. Um, the word saved li- can literally mean saved. Like, um, like if you are drowning and I come and grab you, it doesn't mean you're going to heaven. It means that you didn't drown. That means you were saved, right? The same, same idea of the word here. Look at verse number 20, um, 21. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Notice it said again there. In, in this passage, so verse 21 says the same thing as verse number 16, which has been saying the same thing as verse number 11 and 12. The, the, the whole concept here has to do with the good conscience. You do it because God said so. Verse 15 about sanctify God in your heart. And so what he tells us there in verse number 21, the like figure, so bap, um, the, the destruction of the world by water. Um, in verse number 21, the like figure where into even uh, baptism, so baptism is that thing we're going to be comparing it to, doth also now save us. So baptism saves us like it saved, like the, the water saved them back then. Now, once again, this does not have to do with a cleansing of sin from you so you can go to heaven. How do we know that? Because he explains it in this passage. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. What's he telling us here? Baptism doesn't wash away the, the sins of the flesh. The sins that you commit in the flesh they're not going to get cleansed by, by baptism. Um, but the answer of a good conscience, here's what it produces in you. Here's what it produces in you. A good conscience toward God. That's what it does. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so what he's telling us here, you follow through in your baptism. Now we'll start with bat- water baptism here. You follow through in your water baptism. When you are baptized, it doesn't wash away your sins. But here's what it does. You have a clear conscience before God that you did what was right. Let's put it in context socially. You and I, when you were baptized, how many of you were baptized in a church setting? Did you raise your hand? You were baptized in a church setting. How many of you were baptized like in a creek or in a public area somewhere? So nobody, okay. So, um, but it was, it was fairly common to do that before, wasn't it? Where people were, were baptized in public areas. But here's the thing. Even then, the church would go down to the river to pray, you know, and they wear the white robes and all sing a song, I guess. I'm not sure. But anyways, this is how I saw it in movies. And so um, Shirley Temple movies, that's how they did it. So anyways, when they would go do that, um, it, was, it was exciting and all this kind of stuff. But it was still a very designated area in a Christian society to do so. But what happens, let's say you live in the first century. Christianity is not welcomed at all. And if you want to get baptized, you're going to have to go to where there's water which so does everybody else that needs water. They, people get their buckets of water for their family. People clean their clothes. People bathe in those public areas. And now you're going to go down to get baptized, not just in front of this private area of church people, but in front of people publicly. You're going to have to do something publicly that identifies with the sufferings of Jesus Christ in a way that would be embarrassing or could, that, that can cost you. That could even potentially be dangerous. But here's what you get. In that, even though it may produce suffering, the point is that you have a clear conscience toward God. You did what God wanted you to do. Now, there is an element on this, by the way, in which, um, in in these things, that 
the baptism is not necessarily referring to uh, baptism of water, but literally baptism of suffering. But so, and and there, there's a very strong case for that. In fact, I lean more towards that. Um, th the reason for that is, is several things in regards to what's listed in them. Um, in First Peter chapter one, so the earlier two chapters ago, in verse number ten, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. So the prophets were looking for something um, of the grace that would come to you. Searching, verse 11, uh, or what manner of time the spirit of Christ, which was in them, and who? The prophets from the past, uh, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ, the glory that should follow. And so, in other words, the spirit of Christ in the prophets from the Old Testament, talking about the suffering of Jesus Christ, this is something that's going to happen. So, Christ was speaking through the prophets of things to come. That's what he's pointing out here. Um, in, in these things, he's addressing the suffering, once again, about Christ, all the way from chapter number one. The context has been suffering in chapter number two. Suffering again in chapter number three, like Christ suffered. And so when it comes to baptism, it's not just a random reference, suffer, so get baptized. But again, it's still talking about suffering. And so then the baptism would be like the baptism that Jesus said that he went through. He has a baptism to be baptized of, the sufferings he would go through. Likewise, you have a baptism that you would be going through, and that's that you'll stand up for Jesus. And you're going to do what God wants you to do in spite of the difficulty. You immerse yourself into those things. And so this is something that would happen. Um, in those things, he talks about this for the sake of a good conscience toward God. We can stand right before God knowing, clear conscience, I'm doing what God wants me to do. By the resurrection of Jesus, by the way, that, that's an incredibly important statement because it points out the fact, by his resurrection, we stand up for Jesus with a clear conscience. This is not salvific, your baptism, but it's pointing all the way back to verse number, um, verse number 18. Verse number 22 will be done. Who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. And so what he's pointing out here is, is what he has accomplished. Now, the good thing about this is we have an opportunity to see what Jesus Christ has done, the example that was set. And so here's what we're saying. When it comes to our suffering, the things that we would do for Jesus, don't let anything get in your way. Don't let anything get in your way. You should be considering what the people that have done gone before you, that have done gone before you, that have gone before you, have done that's what I meant to say. All right. So in those things, they suffered, and they were willing gladly to be suffered, to be offered up for Christ. Peter is writing this about suffering, who Christ prophesies of his death in the manner in which he would be killed on the cross. He would be crucified like, like his Savior. And so and understand, Peter's gonna, he's not just saying this. He's going to go through it. And, and I'd like to think that Peter kept up with what he was saying here in these things and that he understands baptism. Understand that result, resulted in something good. When Noah was faithful, continued to preach 120 years in spite of the suffering, in spite of the mocking, in spite of whatever may have gone on. So as only eight people, and he makes an emphasis on the, the few, only a few souls, eight souls that would be in the ark, that would be saved from it. Regardless, that resulted in something good. Do you realize that without Noah, there wouldn't be us? And without Christ, there would be no salvation. But it both required suffering. And for Christianity, suffering is a... Is a element that is a necessary component component to the propagation of our faith people will hear about christ through our suffering it's the reality it's one of the biggest ways and that's why he mentions in verse number 15 be consistent in your suffering so that we have an answer to every man that would ask you of the reason the hope that's within you that's what he's addressing here so for the purpose of having a good conscience before god you walk with god other people are able to hear about Christ. One of the most effective ways, one of the effective ways to lead people to Christ is nothing to do with how to put together a really good response about things in the world, but literally to have a reason for why you're doing what you're doing for Jesus Christ, and that Christ is the only reason you're living. And that's it. And so the rest of that are, is examples. We make a lot of doctrines in verse number 18, 19, 20, 21, where it's literally just saying, Keep doing it. That's the whole point of those passages. I know I went through a lot. I didn't even mention a lot of the verses about um, what Jesus Christ was doing, leading captivity captive in Ephesians 4, uh, the proclamation of victory. Um, so anyway, there, there's a lot of things that we can go on, but we will be done with that. All right, let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll have an offering, and then we'll pray. Lord, I thank you for the, the passage that you gave us tonight in this passage here, that there's a reason for it. I don't know if suffering is something that we would endure today, tomorrow, uh, even this year, Lord, I know there's people in the church that have suffered for you. And, God, I'm praying that you would help us in our, um, 
in our retention of this information, that it wouldn't just be information, but that we would, we would live with that exhortation to righteousness, to live for you, to understand your scriptures better for the sake of application. Lord, that we know that what the suffering that we endure for this present season, this time is but for a moment, and we'll live godly in Christ, you, in Christ Jesus, knowing that, that the reward is from you. Looking forward to the way in which we will stand before you with a clear conscience, ready to receive reward, to, to uh, give you glory with it. So we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. A lot, lot of 